Scientist here at the Institute. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, workshop on federated and collaborative learning, which has been organized as part of the process of writing a proposal for a full semester program on the same topic. And I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, John Ducci, Nika Haktalab, Peter Kebus, Virginia Smith, Nadi Chabro, and Kunal Talwar for putting together a great program. So let's, let's give them some applause. And uh, I'd like to cover a few logistics for the coming week. So, so there is food and coffee outside before the first talk and between talks on both the days. Um, but there is no lunch. So that gives you an opportunity to explore all the, the exciting and ever-changing restaurants on the south side of campus. Um, we do ask that you leave food and coffee outside the auditorium to, to help keep it as, as clean as it is. And, uh, and when you do go outside, there is this... There are some nice lockers on the other side of the building where you can just dump your stuff on the way out, which, which I like using a lot. Uh, so our videographer, uh, Omid Farr, will help you set up your talk. If you have any kind of technical difficulties, please, uh, please ask him for help. And uh, I want to give a special thanks to our uh, events team, Elizabeth and Ashley, who organized all the logistics for this workshop, including accommodation for out-of-town visitors. And so let's give them a round of applause. And uh, now I will uh, hand it over to uh, Ginger, who will say a few things about the workshop. Thank you. Um, I think you said it was going to be three minutes, and that was exactly exactly a three-minute <laughs> intro. Uh, so yeah, really excited to be here today for the workshop on federated and collaborative learning, um, along with you know the other organizers, um, John, Nika, Peter, Natty, and Kunal. Uh, I want to give a very, very brief introduction just to set the stage for, you know, the motivation of federated and collaborative learning very generally. So if you're thinking about, you know, exciting applications of machine learning right now, you might be thinking about something like chatbots or maybe an adjacent application, something like speech recognition or medical applications of machine learning or smart homes or smart cities. Crucially, all of these applications rely on data. So where is this machine learning data coming from? It's not coming from just a single mobile phone user or a single patient or a single hospital or a single sensor. It's coming from multiple users, multiple patients, possibly split across multiple organizations and entire networks of sensors. So in federated learning, the idea very broadly is rather than moving all of that data to one central location, trying to, to push as much of the machine learning workflow to the edge as possible. And there can be nice benefits for doing this. This can help to reduce the strain on the network. There can be possible privacy and security advantages for not moving as much raw data across the network. Um, and this has been something that has been deployed in practice. At a smaller scale, this has been used for cross-silo applications of federated learning, like learning tumor detection models without sharing raw patient data. And this has been used for applications like learning mobile, learning uh, prediction tasks and mobile keyboards without collecting raw text information. But there are a number of challenges that this new paradigm presents. So, you know, at its heart, it's really solving a distributed learning problem, right? Um, and whereas, you know, communication is, is always a known bottleneck in distributed learning, here communication can be very, very expensive. So you might have massive, slow, unreliable networks. You are not sharing the raw data, but there's obviously still privacy concerns with sharing information across the network and with learning a model that's possibly deployed at the edge. And there can be you know, uh, difficult uh, issues in dealing with the fact that the data might differ across each of these devices or across the data silos. So there might be issues with statistical heterogeneity and at a lower level, if you're learning across these devices, there can also be issues with differences in the underlying hardware or connectivity that can also affect how capable each of the devices are at participating in this training procedure. I want to also take a step back and talk about sort of a bigger picture here, which is the idea of collaborative learning. Uh, so more broadly, federated learning is maybe one example of a much broader idea, which is the, the idea of having to learn across multiple sources and stakeholders. And you can imagine many such applications of this, especially as you know, machine learning applications are trying to leverage more and more data. Often we have to think about processing and aggregating data from multiple sources and across multiple stakeholders. And this presents many interesting new challenges. For example, thinking about how to incentivize participation in these data sharing schemes 
how to better enable privacy and security and trustworthy learning schemes, how to effectively model these heterogeneous data sources. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much more about this because one of the goals of the workshop, I think, will be to dive a little bit deeper into these broader definitions of, of federated learning and think more about what we mean as a field by these uh, terms federated and collaborative learning. But I want to briefly say why we're having this workshop. Why are we you know, doing this in the context of uh, the Simons Institute, which we're, we're very fortunate to, to be working with. So, I, you know, one, I think, crucial aspect here is just having a, a need for more foundational science. There are an increasing number of deployments of federated and collaborative learning in practice, but there are still numerous fundamental questions that remain. And one thing that we're hoping to do, uh, you know, as, as a result of this workshop is to develop a little bit more of a consistent notion of definitions, assumptions, and techniques for federated collaborative learning um, that better reflect real-world deployments. So uh, another obvious aspect here, and one reason I'm really, I'm really excited to be with you all today, is also just to foster community in this emerging area. Um, in particular, noting that federated and collaborative learning draw from a very, very wide range of communities, from you know, folks in machine learning, statistics, optimization, privacy, econ, distributed systems. And the, the work here really spans industry and academia. So we're excited to have a lot of diverse viewpoints here today and, and to help foster community in this area. Very concretely for the workshop, some of the goals, we want to discuss recent advances in federated and collaborative learning, but there's also uh, gonna be a major focus on identifying open problems in the field and discussing a path for tackling these open theoretical problems in a way that bridges theory and practice. In terms of some concrete outcomes, so we're going to be, the, the talks are, are open to the public. We're going to be recording the talks and live streaming them. Uh, but we also hope to develop a collaboratively developed paper that identifies and lists out some of these open theoretical problems. And the hope is to use these materials to submit a proposal for a longer initiative, so a semester-long program uh, at the Simons Institute on Federated and Collaborative Learning. I'm not going to go into too many details of the, the agenda. You can find this on the, the website. But you know, roughly, uh, the, the workshop is going to be split into a combination of having some uh, talks on recent advances in federated collaborative learning and, and open problems, and also some focused discussion sessions. And one thing to note here is that these talks are, are open to the public. The discussion sessions are meant for, you know, for smaller groups. So these will be for the invited participants of the workshop. We also have a, a dinner tonight, so please do make sure to attend that if you're in town. That's going to be taking place at, at Gather. Okay, and uh, tomorrow we again have a, a nice set of talks, and we're also going to be spending the afternoon uh, having discussion, but also splitting into some working groups to start uh, actually producing this, this uh, white paper on open problems in the field. Uh, really quick. FAQ, so the talks are going to be live streamed and recorded. Um, and again, these talks are, are open to the public, but the discussion section and, and the workshop dinner will be for invited participants. Any questions before we go ahead and get started? Cool. Okay, we're roughly on time. That's great. <laughs> um, so I want to introduce now uh, Katrina Liggett, who is a professor in uh, at Hebrew University in the School of Computer Science and Engineering, and is also the head of the program uh, that looks at the interfaces of technology, society, and networks. Her research broadly is in data privacy, machine learning theory, algorithmic fairness, and algorithmic game theory. And she's been involved in a number of broader efforts across these communities. For example, she, in 2021, was the co-chair of ALT and of FORC, and is currently an advisory board member for the Harvard University Open DP Project. So we're really fortunate to, to have her with us today. Um, so let's give just a, a, a welcome to Katrina. I have the mic and it's working. And I have a lot of stuff that I'll bring up. And I'm going to cross our fingers that the magic happens. And it doesn't, but it will shortly, we're sure. Yes. Great. So it's great to be here. Nice to see you all. Um, thanks for the invitation. 
I'm going to be talking today about some joint work and conversations that I've been having with Tomer Shadmi, who's a law scholar at the Hebrew University. Um, and those conversations will form the basis of a talk that I hope is a good source of provocations and research directions, um, things at the sort of interface with federated learning that I'm particularly excited about. And I hope some of those might feed into those discussions that we'll be having over the next couple of days. Um, so Tomer and I are at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Full disclosure, I also consult for Google one day a week, um, but this is not work that I do at Google. Uh, when did I first come in contact with federated learning? I think it was in 2014. Um, I gave a tutorial at NeurIPS on machine learning and differential privacy, and afterwards, um, Brendan McMahon came up to me, and he basically, like, in just a couple of minutes, convinced me that, like, the future is going to be data on device, compute on device, and it was really clear that he was onto something, and he was really, really convinced of it at that point. Um, and then it's sort of been, for me, a bit in the background. And then a couple of years ago, Tomer, who, as I mentioned, is a law scholar, not a computer scientist, started asking me, sort of, like, what's up with all this decentralization that's going on in computer science? And, like, what is it really doing? What is it doing right? Um, what's the potential there? And where is it falling short? And so that sort of started some conversations for us that will inform our conversation here today. So caveats, I'm not actually somebody who has been working in federated learning. I'm somebody who's been adjacent to it. Um, in my many sort of research interests and hats, I've worked on learning and privacy and fairness and incentives and all sorts of things that I think are really relevant to the FL uh, conversation, but I actually haven't been working in FL. And because of that, I suspect that I'm going to fail to cite your favorite paper. And I just want to apologize right now for the moment when I do that and invite you to tell me about it. Um, I'm here to learn. So I, this is not in any way an attempt to be a survey. This is sort of, I'm going to tell you a stylized story that's an attempt um, to highlight where I think there's some interesting opportunities for work. In some places, you may tell me, hey, I already solved that problem. That's also great. Um, but I'm going to try to be a bit pr provocative to try to push the conversation here. Um, all credit for anything interesting, I might say, goes to Tomer. All credit for anything wrong, I say, goes to me. All right, with that, let's get started. So for me, the conversation with Tomer and, and sort of my thinking about what do we get from federation, what do we get from um, this sort of decentralization in learning, starts by thinking about, well, what do we have before that? What is the centralized model of machine learning and data use? And what are the things that we're worried about there? And so for me, I tried to split that up into two rough columns of things that go wrong or that are problematic about centralized machine learning. Um, and I called them control and competition, even though I have problems with both of those names. But let's just go through it, even though we all know all these problems. Because I think this is a good starting place to understand maybe what are some of the things that we can try to do differently or better um, with a different architecture. So on the control column, we have concerns that, you know, you kind of hand over all the data to some centralized server and then they do whatever they want to with the data. Um, and so there are no limits on how it gets used, where it gets used, whether it gets reused, whether it gets abused, whether it gets collected for one purpose and then they decide to do something else with it entirely, um, whether the data that litter gets shared or stole, stolen or sold or spied on. Um, and there's also the concerns about what happens from the intentional uses of the data, that the models that you train and the statistics that you publish and the synthetic data that you create all slowly, even if you do it carefully and less slowly, if you do it less carefully, leak information about the underlying data. And then there are these concerns that sort of underlie sort of all of this, we have no control over where the data is going, which are concerns about the folks whose data is being used typically don't really have a voice in how that data is used, what gets computed, how those people get categorized as a result, the ways in which their future opportunities and choices and worldviews and, and sort of definition of self potentially get affected um, by the downstream uses of this data, the impact on groups they care about on society. So that's kind of the, you know, pretty quick, pretty negative story on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, we have all these sort of competition kinds of concerns that come up. 
Um, typically, especially these days, we think about machine learning being pretty big scale in terms of compute, in, in terms of the amount of data that it requires, in terms of the engineering expertise that it requires. And there aren't that many organizations that are up to the task. And so we already kind of narrow the field into, in terms of who can be in the space. And then we have these phenomena where more data tends to beget better models, tends to beget more data. And so we end up with sort of rich get richer phenomena in the space. Um, we have data then concentrating in the hands of a few. As a result, we have economic power and knowledge value concentrating in the hands of a few. And it becomes difficult to break into this market, um, potentially stifling you know, great new innovations that could be um, based on our collective data. The uses of the data end up potentially unaligned with the interests of the individuals from whom that data derives, potentially end up unaligned with the interests of their, the groups they belong to, with society. And we also ended up in a situation where maybe we're underusing data as well. Data becomes unavailable potentially for societally beneficial uses or for sort of new in innovation. And there's sort of limited space to get collaborative and creative um, when we have the data sort of siloed away in this space. And for me, this is where the story starts. And then in 2015, we see this uh, really, I think, insightful paper of uh, Shoker and Shmatikov, um, where they basically say all of that really well in just a couple of sentences. I like grabbed sentences from the paper because they talk about you know, the, the privacy issues, the fact that the, the data could be kept indefinitely, the users have no choice about deletion, the purposes, the fact that there could be subpoenas, surveillance. That was my left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, they talk about the giant's monopoly on big data and the fact that this results in a monopoly on the AI models and the concerns about the fact that users may not actually be benefiting from these models that get created. So they told that story really well already at that point. And then they said, maybe we could do something different. They had this dream. Well, what if the data never had to leave the control of those who generate or own it? Uh, what if our collective data were somehow more widely accessible for a range of use cases? And they made a proposal that really drives in this direction. So in this paper, I'm just pulling quotes from the paper because I think it tells exactly the story that we want to we look at at this point. In this paper, we design, implement, and evaluate a practical system that enables multiple parties to jointly learn an accurate neural network model, it was focused on deep learning, uh, for a given objective without sharing their input data sets. Our system lets participants train independently on their own data sets and selectively share small subsets of their model's key parameters during training. All of a sudden, you notice, okay, we got decentralized, we got individuals having autonomy and choice, and they were choosing to participate, they're gonna actively share. Each participant fully controls which gradients to share and how often. Each participant downloads a subset of the parameters from the server and uses them to update his local model. So individuals all of a sudden became active. They opted into participating in the, in the, in the computation. They are choosing what to share, what to use, what to build, and on top of it, they suggest using differential privacy to pr protect the updates. So they really like looked at our list of concerns and dug into a whole bunch of them really, really effectively. And for me, this is sort of the start of the story. It's like, wow, we had all of these problems. Maybe, maybe we can really like hit a bunch of them with this new architecture. And then, of course, um, we have this paper that uh, coins the term federated learning and I think really kicks off this amazing sort of flurry of work that, sorry, the federated, in federated learning that we've seen in the past five or so years. And so there, as we all know, and as Virginia already told us, we shift the model a bit. And this is the cartoon that I'm going to use for the shifted model. Instead of all sort of shipping our data off to some centralized server that does its computations, now we live in a world in which there's going to be interaction and we're going to be sort of handing back and forth, you know, models and model updates. You know, there are you know, sort of variants on the particulars, but there's going to be some degree of back and forth of interaction. And individuals are going to be not shipping over their entire data, maybe, um, but something that is supposedly more sort of compact um, and takes more of the form of, a, of an update. There's sort of two threads, as Virginia alluded to, 
in this literature, there's more of this cross device model, which is the, the idea that we have a bunch of people's iPhones that are together uh, training a model. Um, and then there's the cross silo version, which is like we have a bunch of hospitals that have data. Um, they have similarities, they have differences. I'm gonna focus more on cross device in what I talk about today, but I will point to cross silo a couple of times as we go along. Um, and I think, I think there's interesting challenges in both. Okay, so what's the hope here? The hope is that this new architecture gives us the opportunity to reduce the information that's shared, to involve individuals actively somehow in the process, selecting the computations and carrying out the computations, um, to allow new modes of collaboration and potentially open up broader uses of the data and a broader set of users of the data. Okay, so that's the set of opportunities that I wanna pull out that we hope we might get from federated learning. And basically for the rest of our time together, what I wanna do is use these opportunities as sort of the structure for our conversation. And I wanna look at them critically and think about where are we now in terms of federated learning, in terms of the theory, in terms of the practice, uh, with, res in, with respect to each of these opportunities. What, where has the progress been? Where are people thinking about these issues so far? And where are the opportunities? What haven't we done yet? Are, are there maybe some interesting questions waiting for us there? So that's the plan. Okay. So first, the opportunity to reduce the information that's leaked. We had all of those issues about you know, data going places and doing stuff that we didn't want it to do. And so the question is, you know, is federated learning going to solve this problem for us? And the sort of first answer is, well, okay, we know there's a problem with machine learning, potentially, if we're not careful, if we don't do something explicit to protect privacy. We know that trained machine learning models, even if they kind of look okay, can potentially encode sensitive data from the, from the training. And it turns out, as you all know, and as many of you have helped highlight, we have the same problems potentially with federated learning. Um, those gradients, even if they don't look like the data, can certainly be revealing. And maybe we'll hear more explicitly about some of that work. So we've had you know, a lot of interest in making it clear, I think, that there's a problem if you don't do something else. And we've also had a lot of beautiful work, really an explosion of work, on addressing the problem head on. So introducing differential privacy as a constraint for federated learning. Um, so many papers I did not even attempt to like a sample from, the, from them all. And this has yielded, I think, a lot. Um, not just on the sort of practical side in the sense that actually we see differential privacy actually being incorporated in some large scale feder federated learning deployments like Gboard and the Apple equivalent, all these things. But also there's been interesting stuff going on on the sort of foundations and the mathematical side. We see new models coming out, like the shuffle model. We see cool new amplification tools, which I view as sort of a more general contribution to the sort of state of the field. Really beautiful math coming out as a result of sort of trying to tackle this problem head on. And we also have sort of progress in the sense that at this point, I think some people really do know that federated learning on its own doesn't solve privacy which is also progress that I think we should you know, be happy with. Um, but there's room to do more. Um, yes, there are more problems on DP federated learning, um, specific technical questions that are interesting, but there are other things that I think maybe are a little less obvious how we tackle them. Like what does an epsilon of two per day mean? So for those of you who are not in the DP literature, epsilon is the sort of privacy parameter, you know, measuring how much privacy is lost. And if you do multiple computations with differential privacy guarantees, those privacy losses add up in a formal mathematical sense. And so when we have a deployment of federated learning with a differential privacy guarantee that has a privacy loss of some value two per day, what does that mean? Um, I think we need to do some work towards well, maybe giving better guarantees, but also trying to understand, does that mean something? 
um, because I don't really think that we have something convincing enough to say there. And also, I think many of the other things that make the federated setting exciting and the challenges there will interact in interesting ways with privacy that haven't yet fully been explored. Or maybe they have and I just don't know about it. So that's where you're going to tell me. So things like, um, if we're interested really in increasing individuals' autonomy or flexibility in choosing which computations they're going to engage in and with whom to compute, you know, who do I want to train my models with? Then we have to ask, well, in that process of finding your tribe and deciding together what to compute, what do you all reveal to each other and to the public and to any sort of central coordinator who's helping you in that process? Um, if we're going to do group deliberation on what to compute or who to allow to use our collective data, we have to think about the privacy concerns about that pro in that process. I, I think there's more work to be done in thinking about if we want federated learning to be more of an open framework, um, how do we structure that? to you know, sort of have the most favorable trust model possible? Um, and how can we reduce reliance potentially on the centralized curator, where we're currently all talking with this one, um, this one sort of monolithic entity? And you know, so the obvious direction here is to sort of combine privacy with more security tools. So I think. There are questions here that are ready to develop and dig into. Okay. Um, next up, I, the opportunity for active individual participation in selecting the computations. So is this happening today? I think in the cross silo model, where a bunch of hospitals are getting together and saying, yeah, I want to train a model to detect this type of tumor. Oh, yeah, you do too. Cool, let's do that together because neither of us has enough data. Yes, they are actively involved in deciding what they want to compute and with whom they want to compute it. Great. Are we actively involved um, in deciding what we want to compute on our iPhones and our Android devo devices and, and thinking about like what we want to compute as a society? so much. Do most people even know they're participating in federated learning right now? Not so much. Um, and as the literature has observed, many individuals who are participating in federated learning may actually not be benefiting from the trained models because those trained models may not actually be good for their data distribution. Um, so what's been done here? There are a number of threads of work that I think are really promising. Um, so one of these lines of work is sort of personalization of the results of federated learning. So we train a, you know, a big general sort of averagey kind of model together, and then you locally maybe do some adaptation. There are a number of sort of techniques that get used for this, but trying to address the fact that, oh, we have some heterogeneity in our data distributions. Maybe we're not all going to be happy with the same model. Maybe there's something we can do about that. Um, we also have um, people trying to understand just sort of more inherently what is the role that collaboration plays in learning under various sort of assumptions about uh, the task and the distributions. Uh, and we also have people thinking about fairness explicitly saying, you know, we want to set as an explicit objective that if we're going to develop a joint model that we care about in some sense the vector of qualities that this has on various people's you know, distributions. And we're going to impose some you know, objectives or constraints on various notions of fairness there. And we also have pe people who are doing really interesting work on incentivizing participation, saying, hey, if you are going to be participating in federated learning, maybe we ought to have designed the system so you're better off participating than not. Or maybe we should design the system to give even stronger guarantees than that. Um, how can we think about that? How, how should we articulate the choices that are available to individuals there? Um, and so I think those are really great starts, but they're just starts. Um, there's more work to do, I think, of, of these flavors. 
one sort of comment that maybe rhymes with some of the things that Virginia was saying at the beginning is that the sort of observation or the problem that one universal model may not be good for everybody when our data is heterogeneous, that's not a federated learning problem. That's a you know heterogeneous data problem, but it's got lots of interesting questions around it. So, okay, let's embrace those if we're talking about federated learning, but it's good to remind ourselves that there was nothing sort of inherently federated about those flavors of questions. Um, I definitely think there's room to think uh, more about fairness and whether fairness is exactly the right concept here. Um, I wonder whether there's more room to think about doing more things locally. And I just question sort of whether or not the literature has been reluctant to go there in part because it conflicts with the narrative. In some sense, like the narrative around federated learning is, hey, it's unlocking this ability to use this sensitive data. And if the answer is, and actually a lot of the time we don't want to lock it, we just want to keep it on device, it's a little disappointing. Um, but if that's the right answer, you know, we should be open to it. And I think, that there's this also sort of opens up, I think, a uh, space to think about problems that occur anytime you take a complicated situation where there are trade offs and conflicts, and the way you solve it is give individual people more control and responsibility. Because what happens often is you give people control and responsibility in an unreasonable way where they have bad choices and can't possibly make them or they're meaningless. And so I'm saying maybe federated learning is letting us give more control to individuals, but I think also you have to pair that with work that's incredibly critical of giving more control to individuals because it can be done very wrong. Um, and also think about maybe can more control to individuals doesn't mean I literally turn the knobs on my iPhone to decide you know, which computations I participate in with which parameters, but maybe rather there are proxies that make these decisions on my behalf. And what can that look like? And what questions does that raise? Um, already in this um, many authored uh, 2021 survey around federated learning, a lot of, I think, key questions here were raised that I think the, the, the literature hasn't dug into quite yet. Who decides what's the model to be trained? What's the algorithm to use? What, what hyperparameters? Who's making these decisions? And the paper says, well, you're kind of going to need a central authority, but also then hints, or maybe not. Um, maybe those decisions could be taken by whoever says, hey, let's, let's all learn this thing. Or maybe those decisions could be taken somehow collaboratively. And I think those lead exactly to the next sort of set of challenges and opportunities where I think there's, there's space to do some really interesting work. Um, so has this sort of federated model led entities to collaborate in sort of interesting new configurations? Again, in the cross-silo world, I think the answer is yes. Hospitals that could not previously learn together are now learning together, and it's great. In the cross-device, setting, I think the answer is no. I am not collaboratively learning models with people who are similar to me in some cool new way. That is not happening. Um, but maybe it could be. Um, maybe it is going to require some rethinking of the system, though, because right now the system is not driven to sort of align with the interests of individuals or groups of society. OK. so. Yes, we're seeing progress. There's also some of this work that I was alluding to before that has this sort of flavor of helping people as part of the federated learning find their tribe. So it acknowledges that there's heterogeneity in data distributions and says, hey, maybe actually you want to take that into account. Maybe we want to train a centralized model and then you want to sort of update that locally with some subset of people who have similar data distributions to you. Maybe you want to, as part of this, you know, process, discover who it is who has similar distributions to you. Um, I think there's a huge amount of potential in this space that's as of yet sort of not fully tapped. And it gets interesting because you cross it with privacy. Um, you start to think about, okay, so how do I do this process of discovery, of, you know, and sort of deciding together potentially what we want to learn. Uh, and there's nice work that says that these combinations, these hybrids, 
actually have benefits if you're caring about privacy. So doing a combination of sort of centralized learning and local learning can actually be good because you don't have to pay for privacy in the local learning part of things. Um, and so that there's sort of an interesting um, sort of dimension there to the design space. But I think there's an opportunity to take a more radical focus on the interests and needs of the participants in the learning. And to think about this question of how individuals can collectively discover the value in their collective data that may not be apparent individually. Maybe there are interesting ways in which our data is similar and which it is different from each other that has value, that has interest. How can we discover that together in a way that respects our privacy? I think it's a very fundamental question that I feel there's, there's room for. Um, we also have these really interesting tensions and trade-offs questions that I think we can dig into. So if we're in a situation where, for example, we have some privacy budget, we're not gonna be able to do all the computations. We have to think together somehow about which computations we're gonna do and with which pieces of the budget. And maybe our incentives and interests in this are not fully aligned. Maybe you're harmed differently or you benefit differently from different computations than I do. How do we build the systems that help us navigate these types of tensions and trade-offs. And the, uh, this, these questions manifest, I think, in many different sort of scales of the, the problem, whether it's you know, hospitals trying to decide together what to compute, whether it's totally non-federated as the US Census deciding what, what computations to, to do on their data, um, but also gets really rich and interesting when we potentially have individuals um, who are engaging in this negotiation. Um, we have questions about how do we let people in a privacy sort of respectful way form these coalitions? Uh, what does the curator learn about people from the ways in which the coalitions are formed if there's a curator involved? When and why do we even need a central curator? What, what are the ways in which we can move to alternative trust models? And then finally, opportunity for wider use of data um, a new market entrance. How do we sort of address these more competition-oriented questions? So what's the state of the art? So my take is the reality on competition is not super great. Um, at least in the cross-device world, as far as I can tell, federated learning is mainly deployed by a small number of very large companies. Um, they have closed proprietary infrastructure that is tied to devices, to operating systems, to apps that sort of already before we came along to think about FL, have massive market power, and others cannot use this infrastructure to access the data in any way. Um, why don't we see small market entrants in this space? Um, I think it's, you know, there are a lot of forces against it. Federated learning requires a large investment in technology, in scientists, like some of you guys, um, in compute infrastructure, it requires generally a huge standing audience of participants, like you actually have to have the people and have access to them. Um, it often piggybacks off of existing models that were built on huge closed data sets. So if you're not somebody who already had those, um, you're in trouble. The privacy protections, they're great, I'm in favor, but they also increase the need for data. And that creates an incumbent advantage as well. And then why are these infrastructures, even if they're run by you know, big incumbents, why they're not open to new entrants? Well, why would they be? I mean, you can tell a, like, we're worried about privacy story, but also, where's the financial incentive? So, where is the progress? Again, probably mostly in the cross silo world. We're getting you know, sort of new market entrants, new opportunities is becoming a theme. Um, and in this world where we're thinking about individuals and their iPhones, there's been some progress. Various attempts to say, like, let's try to generalize this FL framework in various ways that feel like they could be hinting towards a world that's a little bit more open, a little bit uh, more flexible in various ways, but I think there's room to do something much more radical and ask questions like, what would it look like to build a really, truly open federated learning system that looks more like a data marketplace? I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying there are interesting questions there. What's the technical infrastructure that it would require? How are you gonna deal with privacy? How are you gonna deal with privacy budgets? How are you gonna deal with decision making? How are you gonna deal with pricing and all of the economic questions that come along here? There's, so there's a sort of a really massive space of questions 
that you can ask on the way to trying to make our collective data be available as a source of innovation, as a source of insight, as a so source of societal benefit. Okay, so I'm gonna return to my cartoon that was originally about how centralized machine learning has all these problems. And I'm gonna say, well, we kind of still have most of these problems right now. <laughs> but that's an opportunity. We like problems, we like hard problems. So it's good, it's good for the people in this room. But yeah, we kind of still are in this world where individuals don't really see that there are limits on how their data is being used and where it goes. And there's sort of a sense in which they don't really have any voice and what gets computed and the consequences. Yeah, we, like we, we did something. Like there's some privacy intervention there. That's, it's certainly cutting off, off a bit of this sort of spread and the leakage. It's sort of like turning down the knob a little bit. And we still kind of have all the competition problems. So we got lots of problems to solve still. The beginning it seemed like, wow, federated learning, we nailed this, done, we crossed up all the problems. And the reality is a little bit more complicated. And the reality is a little bit more complicated also in a bunch of other ways that I didn't even mention yet. So I wanna just touch on a bunch of other possible challenges that I think offer interesting research opportunities as well in this space. Um, one of them is environmental impact. I haven't heard somebody talking about this, but I hope somebody already is. When you take computations that you would have been doing on some super efficient centralized server and instead do them all these little local devices, there's gotta be some consequences for energy usage. Um, has anybody tried to quantify those? Um, there's also sort of this question that basically is what Tomer said to me once she first heard about federated learning was like, who gave them permission to borrow my compute electricity battery and storage for their interests instead of mine? Um, which I think is a fair point. Um, there's also, I think, a really valid concern that in some cases, federated learning is really explicitly being used, not so much as a protection, but as an excuse to bypass ethical and legal requirements for opt-in or consent and sort of privacy issues. Um, and also there's this sort of, you know, yay, we're getting to unlock all of this data, but also maybe, less yay, we're unlocking a lot of potential un less desirable uses and impacts if we don't have um, additional safeguards in place. There's also concerns which are not super specific to federated learning, but I think take on interesting new dimensions around why should we believe the results um, and can we build some better tools to make the results more verifiable, um, to increase trust in the results that are obtained. Um, there's also sort of this lurking concern that as we decentralize this sort of infrastructure, it may become more challenging, or at least there may become an excuse, uh, to do less of the kinds of auditing and verification that we might want to do on these kinds of systems, whether it's auditing the training data itself, whether it's auditing the behavior of the algorithms. I think there are really nice questions here. Um, let's go develop distributed privacy preserving auditing algorithms. We can do it. I think we have the tools. It's just we have to realize that it's an interesting and important question. So the bottom line for me is that decentralization is less sort of an immediate, yes, we nailed it solution and more of an invitation uh, to spend some more time thinking about the privacy challenges and questions, to, to spend some more time thinking about how do we increase individual autonomy in this whole learning process, um, to generally think a little bit more about how we build systems that take into account the interests and welfare of individuals and groups in society, um, and maybe to create more sort of shared infrastructure that can allow for appropriate levels of data reuse while being respectful of the, the important privacy considerations. Um, but maybe that can unlock this data in new ways that it's not currently, uh, that we're not currently seeing. And then I think the, this is a good moment to do this thing that we did earlier, which is to realize that a lot of these questions are actually not super specific to federated learning. And sometimes they came up because federated learning invited us to abandon sort of the existing assumptions in infrastructure. 
These questions are super relevant in lots of other spaces where we're not actually doing federation, we're not actually doing decentralization. Um, but federated learning was more of a chance to step away from the status quo. And I will leave you with sort of two sort of even less technical takeaways. Uh, one of them is that the architectures that we build have consequences. They have consequences for rights, for norms, for wealth, for politics, for power. These are not the kinds of things we think about, most of us, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but it's maybe worth, in these kinds of contexts where we're doing agenda setting and we're trying to um, figure out what the big questions are, to recognize that. And the other thing that I wanted to do was share a couple of sentences that Tomer actually wrote, um, sort of reflecting on how she views federated learning. And what she, she, she kept emphasizing is that federated learning is, at its core, a really sort of emancipatory, radical idea. Um, and so she wrote, federated learning suggests a radical opportunity for data-based agency and self-rule. Facilitating individuals' agency involves creating technological and legal structures that enable individuals and communities to tell, participate in, and create their life stories through data. This, again, is not the kind of thing that any of us know how to say or write or maybe even think about, but I thought it's a really interesting provocation. It's a very different take on the kinds of uh, problems that, that we're trying to solve, the kinds of things we're trying to build here. Um, and so I will leave you with that and welcome comments, questions, corrections, and such. Thank you. Come on, somebody has to tell me you solved one of these problems. <laughs> Why don't you already solve one of the problems, right? Yeah, Peter. Maybe I can pass this to you. Yeah. So you, um, thanks a lot for the talk. You made it seem like uh, for cross silo, we don't have a lot of the challenges around people wanting to decide whether or not they want to participate. But the way I understand it, it's a bunch of businesses, right? Coming together and saying there's a business opportunity for us and the end users, the patients or the customers of a bank did not have a say in that process. That's um, absolutely true. So there's true. exactly the yeah, same yeah, yeah. flavor yeah, of that's, the problem that that's you a great to point. across the device. Yeah, so, so okay, thank you. Let, let's say that again because it's a good enough point. Let me say it back to you. Um, that I sort of generally was saying in many cases, oh, this, you know, the cross-silo thing is maybe a little less complicated. We've seen more progress. What I should have said is we are seeing, um, I think, more innovation in some sense in terms of unlocking structures and opportunities in the cross silo world. Um, that's not to say that there aren't challenges at the level of those institutions. And as you point out, that's not to say that there aren't problems, consequences, harms for those who with to whom the data is associated, um, which are generally not just the institutions. So absolutely great point. Thank you. Yeah, not to Yeah, I'm trying to form this into a question and kind of failing. So maybe part of the question is, what's the right question here? But I, in this uh, view, especially, uh, I think really crystallizing that last uh, quote that you have uh, for the cross device, it's a view as if you know my device is under my control, and that's a complete fallacy. I mean, my device is not under my control, um, and I'm wondering where. So maybe there's two parts here. One is where maybe where is the boundary between me and you know Google or Apple? Is it really between you know what my device sends to the server, or is is the boundary well inside the device? Uh, and relating to that, we talked about a, a marketplace. One maybe hindrance that, and I'm wondering if this is part of a vision, is is regulatory because right now there's no marketplace because there's only one entity that can actually. Uh, um, you run uh, a fair learning on my device, right? Yeah. It's, you know, if I, uh, you know, just the the manufacturer of the device, and that's it. Um, or and and so maybe in order to, if you really want to realize this um, dream, maybe at, at the end, um, do you, how do you see this? You know, again, I'm not sure what the question is here, but I mean, it's uh, you know. Do you see this as a part of like maybe a regulatory, maybe as with opening up, so any entity can run? Uh, uh, fairly learning uh, on devices and not just the manufacturer of the OS. 
those are great semi questions. Uh, the first one I think is a, a beautiful point, which is that like. I think the boundary between self and these uh, large tech companies is somewhere complicatedly embedded in the device. <laughs> and yeah, it's a great point. The, the device is not mine. I don't control it. Um, there's a lot of things that happen on it that I have no say in and no awareness of. And I, I don't have an answer to the semi question other than to say, yes, this is an important point to acknowledge. And this is these kinds of boundaries are going to be part of this conversation and this and the research challenges going forward. I don't, I don't have an answer there about the the marketplace question. That's exactly sort of the challenge that I wanted to highlight, and I don't I haven't solved the challenge. Um, but yes, right now the infrastructure is proprietary, and so so nobody else can come along and reuse that infrastructure. Um, and it's for like all the reasons that I put up on the slide, but there's not an inherent reason why we couldn't build an alternative, more open infrastructure. Um, but in some cases, it will either require the willing cooperation of large tech companies or the forced cooperation of large tech companies. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Adani. Just to follow up, uh, you made it make it sound like as if uh, only Google and Apple are doing learning on uh, from Apple devices. In fact, it's a multitude of companies who are using these. These, these are basically platforms. They're not just companies like Uber, Facebook. All of these companies collect massive amounts of data and can use and really learning if they want. They can do it in any way they like, and nobody sort of prohibits them from doing, like using these more privacy preserving, they can run their own servers, the apps can send them whatever data they, uh, they like. And, and maybe the one way to think about these companies as providing, making these technologies available, privacy preserving uh, technologies available to other companies and potentially even, ideally even, even kind of establishing certain standards for how the data should be collected and used uh, in a more privacy-preserving So it's me. I don't know if it's a, yeah, it's more of a comment. It, it's a great comment. Yeah, thanks. Okay, no. Just to tell you, it's fine. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Last okay. question. So It'll be a good one. I guess we talked a lot about control, and I guess already if I look at my phone, there's tons of knobs in there that I actually don't understand. I could turn them, but it's not helping me. It's not helping anyone, right? So I think that raises the big question of, I guess it's partly a UI problem. Like I may have some privacy preferences, but there's no way to easily express them on my phone. Uh, and I guess this is not just unique to FL, like websites have privacy policies, no one understands them. And uh, there's, I guess, many other places where similar things happens. So I guess, are there good examples of uh, uh, solutions that exist for such complex UI problems of preference elicitation not, that we can look up to? Uh, not that I have in mind, but I would love to hear if people think that there are. Um, but you're right that this is a, a more general problem that, you know, as I tried to allude to, that, you know, control is a slippery solution in this space because it's not really that I want to expose all of the decisions to you and expect you to make all the decisions. And it's not just a UIX kind of a question, although there's certainly a UI UX component to it. There's also this sort of deeper philosophical question about what does it mean to give you appropriate voice and choice and say and influence? And it probably doesn't literally mean making you make all the choices. Um, and that's not inherently a federated learning question, but it's something that I think, like many of these questions, is brought to the fore because we kind of told ourselves this story that as we pushed the compute out to the edge, that people were becoming participants rather than subjects. And like, maybe it's an opportunity to try to realize that a little bit more. But I, I don't have a, a great answer. Thank you, Gina. Okay. Thank you.